Hi everybody, I'm Jean um, and I'm going to be talking about musculoskeletal trauma. So mechani mechanism of injury, um, two types of energy absorbed and transferred um, and there's two types of injuries, um, blunt and penetrating. So your blunt injuries um, are typically going to be your um, car accidents, your falls, your sport, sporting accidents and your assaults and then your penetrating um, injuries would be your um, impalements whether that's by stabbing or gunshot wounds. And two types of fractures, um, one is open which is pretty much self-explanatory, um, there's a break in the skin and usually the open fractures are from um, very high energy injuries and these are um, much more serious, they're more prone to infection you want to make sure you have antibiotics on board um, quickly and um, they take a lot longer to heal. Your closed um, fractures, those are where the skin is not broken um, and you may or may not have um, gross deformity. And then your dislocations um, where the articulating surfaces no, are no longer intact due to the joint disruption and basically your um, joint injuries are where your bone ends are forced out of position. And um, when you see someone with a dislocation, typically you'll just see them, for example, if they dislocated their shoulder, they'll be limited to no movement at all. And um, with these um, dislocations, you basically, um, same assessment, neurovascular status, you're checking that. Um, so assessment, um, orthopedic injuries may be missed initially. Does anybody know why that is? Um, it's, it's like they're assessing everything else in the trauma room. Right, and sometimes you may have, you're, you're so focused on your ABCs, um, they might have something that's more life-threatening, like a, a bad head injury or um, bleeding in the belly or pneumo or something um, where, you know, a musculoskeletal injury sometimes gets missed. Um, another reason why orthopedic injuries are missed is um, sometimes patients have been in a car accident and they've got a lot of adrenaline pumping and they're they pretty much hurt all over but they don't really realize that they hurt until a couple hours later and um, that's where your assessment is going to be very important and then um, also if you have someone that comes in that's already intubated or they get intubated immediately um, it's you don't have your assessment is limited because um, they're not able to tell you what hurts and so that's where your assessment will be very important as well. So your five P's, um, pain, location and quality, um, ischemic pain is described as burning or throbbing. I'm not sure that anyone can really tell the difference between ischemic or non-ischemic pain. I think everyone pretty much complains of burning or throbbing. Pallor is color and temperature of the extremity. Um, you want to compare that to your uninjured extremity, um, especially if someone has um, dark colored skin or um, that's like the easiest way to tell. Pulses, um, there can be vascular injury as well, so you want to check pulses proximal and distal to the injury and compare that to the uninjured side as well. And then paresthesia, um, any type of burning, tingling, or numbness, um, like a pins and needles type of sensation. And then paralysis, you want to assess their motor function. So when you have someone with the femur fracture, um, in addition to the five P's, what you also want to um, check for is hemodynamic instability. Um, there can be up to a one and a half liter blood loss um, just from a femur fracture alone. And then um, pelvic fractures. Um, pelvic fractures can either be stable or unstable um, based on where the injury occurs. So uh, a pelvic fracture where the one area of the pelvic ring is involved is considered rotationally stable and then where there are two or more areas it's considered uh, rotationally unstable. And then um, vertically stable and unstable is where the SI, if the SI joint is involved or not. And basically one of the orthodox um, pretty much said it's really difficult to just injure one area of the pelvic ring um, because it's kind of like a pretzel. Um, if it were attached to something, um, it's hard to just break the pretzel in like one area. Usually like two parts of the pretzel will break. So, um, And then because the pelvis is so vascular, there's a potential for a um, large amount of blood loss um, because it's... Um, you can have blood loss from the iliac arteries or the venous plexus near the pelvic basin and it's usually um, present with injuries that involve the SI joint. 
And then you also want to check for any neurologic um, complications, and that can result from any type of sciatic nerve damage near the lumbosacral plexus. And um, if your patient um, has a very unstable uh, pelvic fracture and they have to go to IR for an embolization, um, uh, they can also have a neurologic injury from that. Crush injuries. Um, crush injuries can be considered life-threatening because of the cellular damage and blood and fluid loss, compartment syndrome and infection. Um, one of the major complications can be um, rhabdomyolysis and that's when um, myoglobin is released from the damaged part of the muscle and it goes into the bloodstream. And the reason why this is bad is because this can cause renal failure. And that's where it's gonna be important to monitor um, urine output and the quality of the urine. Usually your urine will be very dark. Um, almost, it almost looks like Coca-Cola at times. Um, and then of course you're looking for um, your usual, um, looking for swelling, pain, signs of compartment syndrome, any loss of distal or neurovascular function. So compartment syndrome, um, the body has 46 compartments, 36 are in the extremities, and the reason why compartment syndrome um, can occur so easily is that um, the fascia doesn't stretch at all. So um, any type of external or internal source of pressure can cause compartment syndrome. Um, can anyone name like an external source that could cause compartment syndrome? That? Yep, a cast. Um, it can also be like a crush injury, um, burns, and then um, internal. An internal source would be any type of swelling or bleeding into that compartment. And um, the reason why it's so important to assess for compartment syndrome is because the um, damage can be irreversible if, um, if it's greater than six to eight hours. So um, when you're um, I've never, has anyone ever seen any of them actually checking the pressures? Um, do they do that on your floors or where you work? No. Um, I wonder if they were thinking about checking the pressure and sometimes they don't end up doing it. Yeah, I've never actually seen them checking the pressure, but anyway, if they ever do, 30 to 40 is considered um, where ischemia is present, and then 55 to 65 is irreversible muscle damage. Um, but they do say that that number isn't set in stone because we're allowing for permissive hypotension so that you have to take that into account as well. So the number might be lower. Um, so how will you know if you have compartment syndrome? Um, you're gonna obviously have pain. Um, the pain is very severe. Um, usually the pain is not relieved by pain medicine and any type of passive um, stretching motion. So for example, if they had compartment syndrome in their leg, lower leg, you just ask them to wiggle their toes and that would cause intense, intense pain. Um, firmness, tenseness, tense and swollen, um, any sensory deficit, numbness, tingling, and um, progressive muscle weakness, and loss of pulses would be a late sign of compartment syndrome. Nursing diagnosis. Um, motor and or sensory deficit, altered comfort, immobility, fluid volume deficit, and skin integrity. So what do we do with these fractures? Um, with the open fractures, um, they're dirty, so we obviously want to make sure they're nice and clean. They will either take them to the OR and wash them out. They'll reduce them. Um, antibiotics and tetanus prophylaxis is usually done in the trauma room. Uh, closed fractures um, may or may not need to go to the OR. A lot of times they just reduce them at the bedside. And then femur fractures, um, they'll put the, the skeletal traction in, usually in the trauma room, um, prior to going to the OR. And then um, sometimes they may not take the patient to the OR immediately, so you might have a patient in traction. And so um, pin care is gonna be very important. Um, and I think pin care, um, I. I've asked a few people and everyone has kind of a different answer, like sometimes it's hydrogen peroxide and sterile water and sometimes it's chlorhexidine. Um, but I, I found that they've been writing specific orders for what they want. Um, has anyone experienced anything different or no? Um, neurovascular checks and radiology. 
So fe with femur fractures, you're at a high risk for fat emboli. And why is that? Because when you um, fracture your femur, um, the, bone, the fat in the bone may leak into the bloodstream. And um, it's like a shower of um, small emboli. And it doesn't happen right away. It's usually 12 to 96 hours after the injury. And you'll have your symptoms of um, pulmonary edema, all your respiratory symptoms, hyperthermia, petechiae. And so um, the treatment for this is just supportive care, um, ven mechanical ventilation, vas vasopressor support, typical ICU um, care. So intervention for dislocations, um, they're usually reduced immediately and um, usually the patient feels a hundred times better. Uh, moderate sedation, um, sometimes they'll just reduce them quickly because by the time you get all your drugs, it's um, reduced the patient. Um, checking neurovascular status frequently. And with crush injuries, um, you're giving IV crystalloid and you're elevating the extremity. Um, same with compartment syndrome, you're elevating the extremity to the level of the heart, and sometimes they'll do a fasciotomy for that. So with pelvic injuries, um, did you guys get to play with the pelvic binder at all? In your, oh, okay. Well, sometimes they'll use a sheet, or um, we have this pelvic binder that's bright orange. It kind of looks like a corset that we use um, to stabilize and to control the bleeding. Um, or if that doesn't work, sometimes they'll have to go to IR for an embolization um, or the OR for um, a pelvic X-fix or SI screws. So because these patients are um, not moving and uh, they are at risk for a lot of complications, so it's important to reposition them, um, a chest PT, aggressive incentive spirometry, uh, maintaining their skin integrity since they'll be in casts and they'll have pins, um, preventing fecal impaction and diarrhea, uh, making sure they're on a good bowel regimen, and then preventing um, renal calculi, making sure that they're adequately hydrated. So um, evaluation, um, we're, so we're monitoring how well they're responding to a lot of the therapies. Um, always reporting any signs of any complications, um, checking your five Ps, um, making sure that they don't have compartment syndrome, just being aware of all any little change or trends, and um, you know that is um, we, the last thing you want is for you know that limb to be compromised. And um, sometimes in the trauma room, um, like you know we're saying, it is um, sometimes you don't think about like the extremities because you're thinking about the brain or or the um, abdomen so um, that's pretty much it with musculoskeletal trauma does anybody have any questions